Okay, let's get started. Um, I haven't actually chatted with the TA for some reason. He skipped homework 2.5. I'm not really sure why. Um, I don't think it was, I, I think what happened was it wasn't anything wrong with homework 2.5. I think it was, remember we had that Blackboard outage? I think he was grading the homeworks and then Blackboard went out and then he just went to the next one. So there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with homework 2.5, but I think that's why homework 2.5 hadn't been graded. This was at least as of yesterday. Um, 2.8 and 2.9 are still being graded, um, but all the homework solutions are posted. I'm thinking uh, he'll probably get these done within you know a couple days. Um, and I don't have a homework for you today. I said now homework, it's no homework. Um, I have no homework for you today. Um, that's actually on purpose. Um, today's gonna be very informational, um, and I kinda wanna let this stuff sink in. Um, and then we will uh, get to homework on Wednesday. Um, today, uh, we're, and by the way, uh, I have not, I know if people were asking, have I graded the exam? No. Uh, my goal is to get that done either by Friday or Monday. Um, today, we are going to begin our next module in the class. And I said this before, um, I said this, uh, um, like, I think around the beginning of the semester that uh, you know, when I give exams, I don't like them to be comprehensive. I like to exam, uh, uh, have an exam on one topic and then move on to the next topic. And if there's any one class that probably exemplifies that uh, behavior most, it's this one. This is a very, very modular class. And uh, so this bolted connection module is sort of a, a new topic. There is a little bit of bleed over, but not much. Um, but we're going to get into the wonderful world of bolted connections today. So this second exam, which is coming up right before spring break, is going to be on connections. It's going to be on bolts and welds. Um, one common question that I do get, which I'll probably touch on a little bit, um, is what about rivets? Like, why aren't you talking about rivets? Well, the short answer is we really don't use them anymore, uh, at least in, um, in modern engineering construction. Rivets are um, expensive. They're a little dangerous to install because you have to get them you know, red hot and all that. Um, they're also unpredictable from a capacity standpoint, um, whereas structural bolts are faster, which means they're more economical from a labor perspective. There's not really much of a difference on price point, and um, they're more reliable. So we just, we, just don't use, um, we just don't use rivets anymore. So um, you might encounter rivets in the real world, though, but that's mostly from a rating perspective. And so, but there are pretty simple means of rating rivets and whatnot. And um, I'll be more equipped to discuss that maybe a little later. So, but the star of the show today are bolts. Okay, so let's talk about bolts. Um, I am uh, gonna talk about bolted connections in general. And uh, what I'm gonna do is sort of define the two different classes of bolted connections. Those are bearing type connections and slip critical connections. We're going to spend most of our time in this class on bearing type connections. Um, the way that it works is with bearing type connections, you have two limit states you have to satisfy. And with slip critical connections, you have three. You have the same two plus one more. So if you understand how to do bearing type connections, slip critical connections are pretty easy to handle uh, from a design standpoint. They're really not any more difficult. Okay, So that's why we spend most of our time on bearing type connections. Um, so first off, let's talk about bolts. Um, I should have brought actually a bolt with me today. I didn't. I'm going to try and bring one on Wednesday. Um, but this is an example of a high strength structural bolt that we would see in the real world. Okay. Now, whenever you see a bolt uh, in the real world, you will commonly see two um, markings or, or symbols on it. The first is this top here where it says A325. A325 stands for the grade of bolt, the, a, the, the material designation, the ASTM designation. So this is an ASTM A325 bolt. A325 bolt, again, so this is the bolt designation just like steel has an A36 or an A992 or an A572 grade 50. Um, uh, A325 is the ASTM specification for bolts, which by the way, if you, if, do you have materials? Or how many of you are in 321? Civil engineering materials, uh, or I already had it with Dr. Nile where he did. Okay, okay, that's right. Not that he had it, that was a fall class. But you know how you use ASTM specs to test like cylinders and do sieve analyses and all that? It's the same idea. There's an ASTM spec on A325, ASTM on A490, and all that. Okay, um, 
So the most common grades of bolts are A325 and A490. A307 is not very common, um, but you do see it listed in the spec here and there. Um, I just mentioned it just to explain what it is, but it's really only used for like secondary elements and we really don't use it very much in structural applications. So I just mentioned it there. Now I'm curious um, if anybody knows this. So A325 is the grade of the bolt. Anybody know what this symbol is? Like if this is the grade of the bolt, what do you think this symbol represents? I'm curious. You can guess. I mean, this is the symbol representing the manufacturer who made the bolt. And who made this bolt? What news story about West Virginia recently? Jim Justice. <laughs> New Corps. Big plant. The big steel plant coming in to West Virginia? Has anybody heard of it? Steel West Virginia? No. The new core plant. Oh, you mean new core. <laughs> <laughs> they got one of those in Texas. <laughs> I'm going to move on. <laughs> I'm thinking of Magnum PI jokes that you brought up, by the way, so I'm. <laughs> I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Okay, all right. Okay, um, this slide encapsulates one of the biggest changes from the last manual to this one. Um, and I will be honest, it, just to be blunt, it's gonna take me a little time to get used to this designation because, I mean, just last year we were using different groups, okay? But let me sort of explain what's going on here. The idea is the same. So um, about two specifications ago, uh, AISC started to change the way that they delineated bolts in the specification, okay? And so let me sort of explain why. All right, this right here, if I go back a slide, this is a standard ASTM A325 bolt, okay? Now, when I say standard, I mean that it is, it is to be installed using a standard method, you know, bolt, nut, wrench, etc. right? Okay, now to sort of make the point, this is a different type of fastener. This is called a twist-off control bolt. So we'll talk a little bit more about these later, um, but a twist-off control bolt is used a lot in applications where slip critical uh, is needed. And so the way that it works is you have this really special wrench that has sort of two chucks on it, one of them spins the nut and the other grips the bolt right here and, and they spin in opposite directions. So one of the advantages is that you can actually tighten the bolt with a wrench only on one side. I mean, if you think about this bolt, you kind of need a wrench on one side and a wrench on another to tighten, but you don't need that with this bolt because the wrench will grab this and this simultaneously and twist them in the other direction. Uh, and when you achieve a certain uh, specialized pretension, this little splined nub sort of shears off, okay? Uh, I don't know if anybody has seen these installed in DOH uh, uh, installations. Have you ever seen a bridge where they've uh, been putting a splice in? This is a really, really common way of doing slip critical installations these days because it's really fast. This is called a twist off control bolt, okay? The thing is though, is that twist off control bolts, while they have the same material properties as, uh, as counterpart, um, you know, A325 or A490 or what have you, um, the problem is, is that they uh, adhere to a different ASTM specification. So it used to be that uh, if you opened up the spec, it would just list A325 and A490. That's all it would say. But then somebody would come in and say, well, what if I'm using one of these? What's the capacity? Well, then they would say, I'll just use the same numbers as the A325 or just use the same numbers as A490. Yeah, but it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in the specification. So what they've done in recent editions of the spec is instead of listing A325, A490, et cetera, they have grouped these in these sort of classes that have the same material properties. So all of these bolts, these A325, F1852s, F3125s, uh, all et cetera, these all have the same material characteristics. And so they group them in this group and they call it group 120. Um, this is a big change from the last spec because it used to be just a group A and a group B. Now there's multiple groups. So. Um, so the reason I mention this is that 
if you're on a construction site and you ask somebody where are the group 120 bolts, they're gonna sort of look at you strangely because there's no such thing as like a group 120 bolt. Instead, what they've done is they've taken a number of different type of bolts that all have similar material properties and lumped them into this specification classification. Th does that make sense? So A325 bolts are the bolts and they fit within this group and this group has a bunch of different bolt types that all have the same material properties. Okay, everybody with me on that? Okay, so this is, again, and this, this series of group numbers, like group 120, group 150, that's new. That's new from, from the specifications. I, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, all right, so the big thing to ask is how, like, okay, so what do we need to do as structural engineers? What do we need to assess uh, when we're, analyzing and ultimately designing a bolted connection. Well, the big thing we have to ask is how does a bolt assembly resist load? Okay, so if I have plate, plate, stick them like this, and I stick a bolt through them, and I take the plate and I yank on it, how does the bolt keep the plates together? Like, how does it do that? Okay, well, there are three force resistant mechanisms that I claim are going on, okay? The first thing that's happening, so I've got plate, 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 bolt through, and I do this. The first thing that could happen is I could just shear the bolt in half, right? I could literally just take the bolt and shear it right in half, okay? So that is bolt shear, okay? Um, the second is the force generated by the bolt meeting the plate, which what, what I'm gonna call is bolt bearing. So what I mean by that is, okay, so let's say here's a plate, here's a bolt, the bolt is going through the, the bolt hole and I yank, well, one of two things could happen. I could either snap the bolt in half, I could shear the bolt in half, or the bolt is also mashing on the edge of the plate hole, right? So the bolt is actually coming into physical contact with the edge of the plate, and I could fail the plate that way. That is a different mechanism than like gross section yielding or net section fracture or block shear. That's actually the physical hole itself uh, right there around the plate, the plate itself failing around the hole region. There's two different ways that can happen and we'll see that later, okay? So those are the, 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 the two resistant mechanisms that are gonna happen in like all bolted connections. Either you're gonna shear the bolt in half or the bolt is gonna come into contact with the plate and the plate is going to fail. So that's bolt shear and bolt bearing. The third resistance mechanism, and this is the one that is a little unique, um, and this is what defines the difference between these two, is friction, okay? So what happens when you take a plate, a plate, do like this, stick a bolt through them, and you start tightening the plate, or sorry, tightening the bolt. So you take the bolt and you tighten it. You tighten it really, really tight. What happens to the two plates? They set together, right? In fact, the harder that you wrench on that bolt, if you were, the, the more like torque that you apply to that bolt, the more normal force you are applying between the two plates, right? So these blue loads, sort of these blue arrows here and here, correspond to me tightening the bolt and the plates sandwiching together, right? Well, now what I'm doing is I'm taking these plates that have a significant normal force, right? And I'm yanking on it. And if I have a normal force and I have a coefficient of static friction between these two plates, I can generate a frictional force that keeps the plates together. Does that make sense? So remember that from statics, right? If I have a normal force times a coefficient of friction, I can get a resistant force, right? It's like when you're in your apartment and you're trying to move the couch, right? It takes a while to get the couch moving, right? And the force that you have to apply equals the weight of the couch multiplied by whatever the coefficient of friction is between the rubber feet on your couch and whatever your floor is made of, right? And then that, once you exceed that, the couch starts moving, right? That's, that's the, the, the friction force that we overcome. And we can have the same thing here, okay? So I propose that the two main categories of connections that we deal with are bearing type connections where we sort of don't worry about friction and we just deal with the bolt shear and the bolt bearing, 
and then slip critical connections where we actually do account for that friction. Okay. Now, when do we ever use slip critical connections? Well, we use slip critical connections whenever um, we really want to ensure that the two plates do not slip, that they maintain their geometry between the two. Um, and I'm sure, like, I could spend a whole semester just talking about connections and different limit states and different scenarios. So I'm going to give you two hyper simplistic examples of when we would care about slip, okay? The first is earthquakes, okay? Because we want that connection to, to, to be, um, uh, um, that geometry to be maintained. Now, there are nuances about what Logi designed for and what you detail it for, and I'm not going to get into that. But earthquakes is an, is an example where slip would be something that you would care about. The other is fatigue considerations, okay? So to make the, the point, um, imagine what would happen if you had, let's say, your lawnmower, okay? You're running the lawnmower and you have a bolt through some piece of the lawnmower and it's going like this. If you don't have that bolt really tight, what's gonna happen because of all that cyclic loading? The bolt's just gonna get loose, right? So during um, fatigue prone structural situations, we tend to install slip critical connections. Now, while we are not applying load at this high of a rate in most structural engineering applications, there are some applications where we do apply cyclic load all the time and we see them outdoors and those are bridges, right? So with bridges, the loads are on, on, off, 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 you know, so on and so forth. And that happens for, you know, a design life of 75 years. I mean, that's what ASHTO dictates as the design life for structures in the United States. Um, so if you're going to, the idea is that bridge sits there for 75 years, a slip critical connection suddenly isn't that crazy of an idea. Okay. Does that make sense? Without getting down the rabbit hole of the math, one thing I'll say is that slip critical connections tend to have about twice as many bolts as their bearing type counterparts. Like if you had a situation and designed this for a bearing type connection, you use 12 volts, chances are for a slip critical connection, you're probably using about 24 volts. So that's not like um, always the case, but a rule of thumb of two is probably not, um, not all that crazy to, uh, uh, to predict. Okay. So far so good? All right, so we're, when we're looking at bearing type connections, with bearing type connections, we really only have two limit states that we have to assess. And bearing type connections are the ones that we're not accounting for friction. So with bearing type connections, we either have failure of the bolt or failure of the plate. Now when I say failure of the bolt, I mean that the bolt will fail in shear. Here's the bolt going through the plates. We're uh, applying load like this, so the bolt will literally shear in half. So we're talking about the shear capacity of the bolt. For the plate, again, there are two different ways this can happen. I'm going to show you some pictures of that that will uh, illustrate that a little better than I can verbally. Um, for each of these, we're going to have a design resistance that we can compute. And for, uh, for bolt shear, we're going to have a very handy design aid that we can use. And in fact, this is going to be our very first excursion into using design aids uh, in the manual. Um, the other thing I will mention is that we are going to have connection layout requirements that we're going to have to meet. And what I mean by that is we're going to have limits on how far apart bolts can be spaced from each other. We're going to have a limit on how far bolts can be from the edge of plates uh, for, for very specific reasons. But we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Okay. So let's take each of these limit states one at a time and let's, let's uh, make sure that we understand them. So the first thing that we're going to discuss is bolt shear capacity. And so basically what I'm asking is if I have a single bolt and I apply shear to it, how much load can that single bolt resist before it fails? How much load until the bolt shears in half? And so the two questions that we're going to have to answer beyond just like the, the, the fundamentals, like what's the diameter of the bolt, what material is it made out of, et cetera, is what are the thread conditions and how many shear planes there are, okay? and, and uh, it's actually pretty easy to understand once you sort of wrap your head around it. You're like, oh, okay, this isn't that bad. Again, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think that I, I think it's fair to say this unit and the welded connection unit is one of the easier um, uh, uh, segments in the class. So bolt shear capacity comes from uh, uh, chapter J, and and I, I want to mention a couple of things. This is actually the same equation that we've already used when we looked at threaded rods. But with threaded rods, we 
sort of um, rearranged that equation specifically for threaded rods and specifically for design. So for, for here, for bolts, we're going to look at it a little differently. Uh, instead, we're just going to look at computing the capacity directly. So what we're going to need to determine is the area of the bar or the bolt, which in this case is just pi over 4d squared, uh, and then the nominal shear stress. Okay. Um, the two looming questions that are going to come up, I've already mentioned these, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear in explaining it, is are the threads included in the shear plane and how many shear planes are present? Okay. Um, now, again, the other, oh, the other thing I'll mention is um, I'm showing you an equation, and we are going to use this equation today, and then we are never going to use it again. Okay. And the reason that we're never going to use it again is because of design aids in the manual that are going to make our lives a lot easier. Okay. So before we get to that, oh, here's, that's, I don't know that that's an error. I mean, it's a little error, but the naming is still right. Okay. Um, the threads being in the um, uh, shear plane, what we're essentially asking is if we take a plate, so we have plate A and plate B, and we stick a bolt through it and we apply load, the question is, are we shearing through the bolt through the threads or are we shearing through the bolt in the main body of the shank? Okay. Does everybody see like why that, you know, why that would be a question that we would need to answer? L let me ask you this. Between the two scenarios, threads included or threads excluded, which do you think is weaker? Threads included. Threads included. Exactly right. So we have a naming convention that we use for that. We use the letter N for representing threads included or the letter X for representing threads excluded. And that, since we don't, whoop, since we don't use uh, group A anymore, I guess that should be 120. Whoop. 120. Ah. N and 120 X and so on and so forth. But that, that part doesn't really matter. But the, the point I'm making is that whenever you see the letter N, that's going to correspond to threads included. And when you see X, that's going to correspond to threads excluded. So this is an N, this is an X. Okay. Now, one of the things that's worth mentioning is that you're going to have some problems where I don't tell you whether or not the threads are included or excluded, or better yet, it might be a design scenario where you don't know whether the threads are included or excluded. And if you don't know, what should you do? Assume they're included. Assume they're included. Exactly right. So if you don't know, assume that the threads are included. Okay. Make sense? And I will say that on slip critical connections, good chance is it doesn't matter. Because, again, the slip limit state is going to govern anyways. But we'll get to that later. All right. Now, I actually do want to uh, check out this table real quick. This is in 16.1-137. This is in the spec. I want everybody to open this. This is from the newer spec. Um, now, the, the thing about this, uh, this table, we've already looked at it before. Um, we looked at it when we looked at threaded rods because we use this term here. But um, I want to make sure that we're clear on the anatomy. So what we have are the description of the fasteners. So before, all we did is we looked at this row down here. Because this row down here was for, you know, basically what it says, this is a bolt, this is a bolt, 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 bolt. This is for anything that's not a bolt. So before, we were looking at this for threaded rods. We were only considering this lower row. Um, and what we were looking at before, when we looked at threaded rods, we were looking at elements in tension. Okay? So we said, here's the tensile stress, and we used 0.75 FU. Whereas over here, now we're looking at nominal shear stress. And so basically what we're saying is this is the amount of stress or tips per square inch that the bolts can withstand under different scenarios. So this is a threads included. This is a threads excluded. And if we look at both of the or at any of these scenarios, we always find that the nominal shear stress for threads being excluded is always higher than the threads being included. Because again, bolts are stronger when, they are, uh, when they're not being sheared through the threads. Okay? 
So we're actually we're going to use this so uh, uh, directly today, but after we're, after today we won't be using this very much. There is one lecture with combined loading where we do need to find these values, but uh, other than that, this should be pretty straightforward. Does this make sense? And by the way, if you look here where it says like. 54 parentheses 370. The 54 is in KSI. The 370 is in SI. That's megapascals. So you could ignore the parentheses values because that's just SI. And we're not doing SI in here. Okay. Make sense? Okay. The only other question to ask is the number of shear planes. Okay. So the number of shear planes is literally just how many different planes are present for the different connection. So, like, for example, this is what we would call a basic lap connection. And so there's only one plane passing through the bolt that would need to shear in order for the bolt to fully fail. So we would say that this bolt is in single shear, okay? But this connection right here, this is very emblematic of what you would find in a splice connection. And in a splice connection, um, it's possible that the bolts are in double shear. So it doesn't mean that the bolt got magically twice as strong. What it does mean though, is that in order to fail this bolt and shear, we have to shear through twice as much area, okay? So what we would essentially be doing is taking the capacity, so the difference between the bolt shear capacity of this one and this one is that this shear capacity is double that of this one because it's twice as much area, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So a quick exercise just to make sure that we're all following along. Um, what is the design resistance of a three quarter inch diameter A325 bolt in uh, a single shear, assuming that the threads are excluded, okay? So what we're essentially trying to find is phi R N, okay? Now I am gonna slightly introduce you to some notation um, uh, or sort of, you know, introduce this. So I'll put this over here because I'm going to start using this. I am going to throw this notation out. So you'll see me use this uh, somewhat regularly throughout the um, uh, throughout the next couple of weeks. Uh, the difference between a phi R M, which is a capital R, and a phi R M, which is a little r. So phi big R, I'm going to basically say that's the capacity of the connection or the whole member, whereas phi little r is the capacity of the individual connector. So, like for example, if I'm talking about bolt shear and a connection has 12 volts, the phi little rn might be eight kips, but the phi big rn might be 96 kips because it's the capacity of one volt times the number of volts. Does that make sense? The, the reason I'm using the term connector and not bolt is because I'm gonna use the same terminology with welding. And with welding, I'm gonna treat a connector as an inch of weld, and then it's times the number of inches. So it's kind of the same idea, all right? Make sense? Okay, so let's see if we can reason our way through this. So we've been given a bolt diameter of three quarters of an inch. So this part should be easy. So what do we get for this? And let's give it to me in like three decimal places. There, there is actually a reason I'm asking for three decimal places. You'll see why here in a second. Do I have a second? Okay. It's exactly right. Okay. All right, there is a reason that you'll see why I asked for three here in a second, okay? So 
The next thing that we need to determine is the, the FNV value. Okay, now in order to determine the FNV, we're gonna look up the FNV from table J3.2. Okay, so I'll, I'll list this right here. Now I'm curious, can anybody just tell me what FNV is gonna be for this bolt? 68, okay. Now you selected that because of why? Group what? 120. 120 and exactly. Okay. So therefore we'll call it phi rn, phi little r, right? What is that? Oh, make that go away. That is phi FNV AB. By the way, um, is it single shear or double shear? Single shear. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say 0 0.75, because that's our fee value for bolt shear, 68 KSI, 0 0.442. And I'm going to do a one right here to indicate that it's single shear. So if you're wondering why I have that one there. Single shear. And so what do we get for phi RN? 22.54. So we'll say 22.5. And the way I'm going to write that is kip per bolt. So that's why I'm using the little r just to indicate that that is the shear capacity per bolt. So if that connection had 10 bolts in it, it'd have a, capacity, a connection capacity of 225 kips in bolt shear. Make sense? Okay. All right. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Right. Oh, that's a uh, great question. Uh, that's right here. So the, shear, the resistance factor comes from the spec that whenever we're looking at bolt shear, the, sh uh, the fee value is 0.75. Okay. And the same thing is also, the, the resistance factor is also going to be 0.75 for bolt bearing uh, here in a second. Okay. So far so good? Now, that is how you compute the capacity of a bolt in shear. And what I'm going to tell you is you're never going to do it again. Okay. The reason why you're never going to do it again is because of this. Okay, so this is on page 7-1, uh, or sorry, 7-21. So this is in the body of the spec, okay? This is um, one of the most useful handy guides in the manual, okay? And this is definitely worth bookmarking, okay? So much so that I put a bookmark here this morning for this page, okay? This is on 7-1, or 7-21, and it's table 7-1, okay? I highly think that you should place a bookmark here, not just for table 7-1, but also for table 7-2 and 7-3, because we're going to use all three of them by the time this is all said and done. They're all right next to one another, okay? I'm going to give everybody a sec to find this, okay? And then we're going to talk a little bit about navigating it, um, just to make sure that we're all comfortable with, with how it's organized. I only have a small piece of it. Um, and by the way, there's still not a digital copy of the manual, but I said, I, I can't wait. So I actually just took a picture of this and put it here in the slide. Okay. Um, first off, before we talk about navigating this, this is our first foray into using design aids in the manual. We are not using green numbers. We are using blue numbers or uh, uh, the numbers that are not shaded. Okay. So do not look up any green numbers. Okay. Because we are using LRFD. Okay. Now. The way the table is organized, so we have columnar values that correspond to bolt diameters, right? So this is the column for 5 8 diameter bolts. This is the column for 3 quarter. By the way, what do we see next to 3 quarter? 0 0.442. That was the area of the bolt already computed for us, okay? So what do we see that it's reporting? It's reporting phi rn, the phi little rn per connector, okay? 
All right, so we're in this column, okay? So what do we see over here? Okay, well over here, first column, designation, group 120, group 144. We're in group 20, okay? Which thread condition do we use, N or X, for this problem? X, thread's excluded, okay? So we're over here. We have two rows, S and D. What do the S and D stand for? Single or double. Single or double shear. So we're in single shear, three quarter, and, well, by golly gosh, gee, look at that. What do I have? 22.5. You see that? So you don't need to do that. You don't need to go through all that exercise of computing it. It just did it for you. Now, I want to be clear. I don't really think there's anything hyper-magical about this table. There's nothing that you all couldn't do in an afternoon with a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Just compute it all. That's basically what this is, okay? But it's all there, okay? And so... Table 7-1 covers two pages because if you turn the page, you turn the page, it's got bigger bolt diameters, okay? But we're probably mainly going to stick with this first page. But this is a really, really um, nifty um, a, a guide and a very useful one, okay? So I highly recommend that you bookmark that because we are going to use it, okay? Make sense? Okay. All right. So that, I mean... I don't really have anything else to say on bolt shear capacity. That's basically it, okay? I want to spend the next little bit and the rest of the lecture talking about bolt bearing. So bolt bearing is when the bolt comes into contact with the plate and it is the plate that fails, not the bolt, okay? So you can imagine that this would happen if you had a hyper strong bolt and a really thin, weak plate. It's the plate that's failing. And what's going to happen in the real world is one of two things. The first is that you can actually have sort of like a, a fracture here, oh, here, and here, like that. And we call this bolt tear out. Okay? And the equation that we're going to use is very similar to the expression for block shear. Okay? It's sort of a mini block shear. Okay? Um, that is the first possibility that could happen. The second possibility is what's called bolt hole ovalization. And what that means is that instead of the plate tearing out and actually there's like a shear fracture, instead of that happening, what happens is the bolt comes into contact with the plate, but instead of the bolt tearing, it just sort of like mushes up and plastifies, kind of turns into like the steel equivalent of Play-Doh, okay? And so the plate just sort of gives up and stops resisting load. So you get this sort of mashed up stuff right here, okay? Now, the other thing I'll say is that the tear out expression is very, um, how can I put this? It's very mechanistic. I mean, you can see the 0.6 from block shear and all that. This equation is very empirical, okay? It's, uh, there's, there's some common sense to it, but really it's just an empirical expression uh, to compute the capacity, so. I just mentioned that for when you see the equations. Okay, now, um, this is a point where you kind of have to start navigating the spec a little bit, okay? So I kind of want to help you navigate the spec a little bit. So we're in chapter J again. We're gonna spend a lot of time turning back and forth between chapter J. Uh, and so I'm on page 16.1-143. So just so you're aware of the way chapter J is organized, chapter J is the chapter on connections. J1 is like the general stuff, J2 is welding, J3 is bolts. So there's like all these different sections in J3, like J31, J32, J33, that all correspond to bolted connections. So J311 is the section on bolt bearing, okay? And if you look at this, so there's J311, and then you get into to, uh, the specifics, and there's all these different subsections in J311 just on um, uh, bolt bearing. So the first thing that we get from the spec, we get that the, the fee value is 0.75, okay? That's easy, okay? Then uh, we get section 11A and 11B. So we're gonna look at 11A, uh, snug tightened or pretension bolts uh, and high strength bolted connections, okay? So we're not gonna worry about J, uh, 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 11B. If, uh, this is organized a little differently since the last spec, but if I remember correctly, um, uh, 11B is like on slotted holes or something like that, so we're not going to worry about that uh, for in here. Um, when we look at the way the specs organized, so we have a section on bearing and a section on tear out, and between those, it asks us whether or not we consider deformation a design consideration or not. 
We're going to consider deformation as a design consideration, so we're going to use this equation and this equation. And very much like block shear, in order to compute the bearing capacity of a single bolt, we're just going to take the minimum of those two. So where did this equation come from? It came from recognizing that we're going to consider deformation as a design criteria, and we're just going to take the minimum of those two. So the nominal capacity of a bolt um, is, you know, just, just distilling the specs a little bit, is the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU or 2.4 DBTFU. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Okay, so what I propose is that for a given bolt, if you want to compute the bolt bearing capacity, you could take the minimum of these two, either the minimum of the tear out capacity or the bolt bearing, the ovalization capacity. So what in here is stuff that we know? FU, that's pretty easy. That's just the ultimate tensile stress of the plate that we're looking at. What about T? T is the thickness of the plate material. So if it's a plate, it's just the thickness. Whereas like if it's a channel, it might be the thickness of the web or the thickness of the flange or, or whatever. It's just whatever plate material we're going through. All right. What about the bolt diameter? That's pretty easy. Okay. Um, fee value is 0.75, but one term that's a little new is LC, right? LC is the term you haven't seen before, okay? So that's the term that we obviously got to explain, okay? Because if you understand how to compute LC, you know how to compute everything else, so it's, it's not bad, okay? But this is our expression, um, and what I will warn you about is that there are multiple LC values. There's an LC for edge bolts and an LC for interior bolts, okay? Um, the only other thing I'm going to tell you is that I'm about to annoy you a little bit because I'm going to throw a little quirk at you here in a little bit. and You're not going to like me, but I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. So you'll see what I mean here in a second. All right. Everybody with me so far? So barring uh, understanding what LC is, computing bolt bearing capacity should be pretty straightforward. So what's LC? What's the deal with LC? LC is the clear distance between the edge of plate material, okay? So what I mean by that is it's either the distance between the edge of the plate and the edge of the hole, or it's the distance between the edges of adjacent holes, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce some notation, all right? So if I've got a plate and I'm yanking on it like this, we're gonna use S, for the longitudinal spacing, which we already did that. I mean, we used S before when we were looking at um, a stagger package. It's the same distance, right? Um, but I'm also going to use LE to, uh, uh, to uh, denote the edge distance, okay? Now, S and LE, this is what you would tell the fabricator, right, when you're actually drilling the holes. Because what the uh, fabricator is going to do is they're going to do a punch right here and a punch right here, and that's actually where they're going to drill the holes. So this S and LE come from actually just measuring the, the plate, okay? That's where that comes from, all right? Now, if this is the bolt spacing and this is the edge distance, I propose that the clear distances are literally just edge to edge, edge to edge, okay? Now, in order to compute, let's say, this one right here, how do I compute this one? Well, I take this, this distance right here, and I subtract half a hole diameter. Does that make sense? And then for this one right here, I take the bolt spacing and I subtract half, half, so I subtract a whole, an entire hole diameter, okay? So I'm using, so I could propose that for an interior bolt, the clear edge distance is the spacing minus a hole diameter, but for edge bolts, it's the edge distance minus half a hole diameter. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, I told you that I'm going to annoy you, and what I'm going to annoy you with is this. Okay? When we check bolted connections, what we're doing is we're checking the physical dimensions of the plate, uh, of the actual hole that's present. What I'm getting at is that this is a different question than when we were computing net area. See, when we, if you remember, when we wanted to compute the hole diameter, we took the bolt diameter, we added an eighth of an inch, okay? The reason why is because we added a sixteenth twice. The first sixteenth of an inch we added because we're actually physically drilling the hole a sixteenth of an inch larger than the bolt diameter, right? 
But the other sixteenth of an inch was for damaged material. What we were saying is that little bit of damaged material is not effective in transferring stress to the rest of the member. But I'm not looking at the whole member. I'm looking at the connection. I'm just looking at the properties of the plate right here. Okay. So I propose that you do not use the bolt diameter plus an eighth of an inch. You use the bolt diameter plus a sixteenth. And I know that's going to annoy you a little bit, but I did try and help a little bit because if you remember, I was calling this DE. I'm not calling it DE, I'm calling it DH. Okay? So we're using the actual physical dimensions of the hole because we are looking at the connection. Okay? Does that make sense? Mr. Dangerfield. Sir? There's Mr. Dangerfield. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was distracting. Okay. Um, when we're looking at edge bolts versus interior bolts, um, what we're talking about, it, it, so I just want to make sure that we're orienting ourselves correctly. The edge bolts are the ones, so if we take the member and we yank on it this way, okay, the edge bolts are the ones that are out here. So these are the edge bolts and these are the interior bolts because it's so like if we're looking at right here, okay, the plate is going to want to tear out like that. That's what's tearing out, okay? So this is the edge bolt. Uh, the interior bolts are right there. So this connection would have four edge bolts and 16 interior bolts. So if you wanted to compute the bolt bearing capacity, compute the capacity of an edge bolt, compute the capacity of an interior bolt, and then say the total capacity is four edge bolts and 16 interior bolts. That's how you would compute the capacity of the connection. D does that make sense? So there's going to be a little R-N-E, a little R-N-I, and then a big R-N for the whole connection. So it'd be like this. Like something like that. That would be how we would handle it. Does that make sense? Any, any questions on that? Okay. One final observation um, that I want to mention, uh, like I said, the, uh, the tear out equation is sort of like a mini block shear, okay? Because what we're doing, if we look at the tear out expression right here, if we look at this, so what's happening is if we have a bolt hole, we're considering this block that's what's tearing out, okay? And if I ask myself, what is the shear area? What is the area of this right here? What is that? Well, the area is LC times the thickness, right? So if we're thinking about this in terms of block shear, if I take this, multiply it by a capacity, right? And then multiply it times a two, okay? That because, and the reason why there's a two is because there's one here and there's one here, so there's two areas. That would give me the capacity, except for the fact that this is a section loaded in shear. Because it's loaded in shear, I gotta put that 0 0.6 next to it. Well, what is 0 0.6 times two? It's 1.2, right? So this expression is really sort of like a mini block shear check, and that 1.2, it's not 1.2, it's 2 times 0.6, okay? So this is what I was saying when I say anytime you see something in shear, chances are that 0.6 is in there somewhere. Even with bolts in shear, like all that stuff is baked into the, the value that we look up, okay? So, so yeah. Any questions? All right. So we're getting close to time, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like to do a homework today, because there's actually a whole nother question that we need to answer, and that's how far apart can we space bolts from each other? Like, well, if we're actually designing a connection, how do we space the bolts out? We haven't talked about that, okay? And I, I want to talk about that um, before we get into, um, before we get into, uh, uh,